Good, uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone. Um, my name is John T. Pierce. I'm editor of Call Center Helper, and we've got a very fascinating um, webinar installed for us. It's called The Power of One in Call Center Staffing, which I think uh, is a topic I know lots of people are uh, very interested in, and certainly from the numbers who've registered and uh, who, are, who are just dialing in, I think uh, we're in for a, quite, a, quite a good session overall. Today, I'm, just, uh, I'm the John T. Pierce, editor of Call Center Helper. I'll be doing the introductions and uh, also question and answer and a few of the technical bits behind the scene. Uh, very, very pleased indeed to have uh, Penny Reynolds, who's a senior partner of the Call Center School. Uh, Penny is actually the inventor of the uh, Power of One, which is a very useful uh, Call Center staffing technique. And I know a number of um, people have used this very successfully. It's, uh, it's, it's actually quite a, a simple technique, but I think uh, like some of the best ideas, uh, simple uh, is often best. So I think it's going to be fascinating to um, hear from Penny, the inventor, on that. Uh, we're then going to have a session by Chris Dealey. Chris is with Envision Software, and Chris is going to take us how you use uh, workforce management to manage the power of one. So I think that will fit in very well. And uh, then we're going to go through interactive uh, questions and answers. I'm now going to pass the baton across to Penny, and uh, Penny, if you'd like to uh, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Jaunty, and we're delighted to be joining from the other side of the pond this morning. I'm joining from uh, the, the U.S. this morning, so I want to welcome all of you to the session, and uh, we're delighted to be here. We're going to be talking today about the power of one in call center staffing. It's a topic that is um, important to every call center manager, every workforce planner out there, and it's all about getting the, the just right number of people in seats. So we want to focus on that and also look at the difference just one person uh, makes. So John, if you'll uh, forward the slides on through, all the, we've, we've done all the bio stuff, I guess, and you'll know who I am. I'm the one with the different accent this morning. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so in this session, we're first going to talk about the importance of the power of one and the importance of it really as if you don't have the right number of people in place, you're either understaffed or overstaffed. So we're going to talk a little bit about the quantification of both of those scenarios. Then we'll talk about the basic steps of workforce management that get us to that right number of staff in place. And what I'm also going to share with you are just uh, basically, I think there's two important components of getting that power of one, of getting that just right number of people in place. And one part of it is an education piece and helping the frontline staff, helping your agents understand why they are so important. So I'll share some um, unique ideas and, and training concepts about how to get that message across to them. The other part about getting that just right number of people in place are these steps of workforce management, proper uh, forecasting and staffing calculations and scheduling and, and so on. And so we're going to talk about some resources that support that as well. So we've got a busy hour uh, ahead of us here. So on the next slide we see that um, we're going to do a quick poll so that we sort of take a look at the audience here first. So we have a poll up, Jaunty, oh, there it is. So what is the size of your contact center? So are you under 50 seats, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 4, or over 400 seats? We've got, uh, most people have uh, voted now. We've just got a, okay, a few more cool. votes to come in. So okay. if you could, uh, if you could, uh, could vote now. And I think we've just got uh, one more person to vote. Okay. That's great. I'm just going to close the, uh, the poll off now. And I'll share the results up on the, uh, up on the okay. screen. So we have a good even spread uh, today. So about a third under 50 seats, another about a third 50 to 100, and the rest in the, the, the bigger over 100 sizes. Okay, so we have a good, good mixture in our group today. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for voting. And there will be some other polls coming up as we go along today. All right, as we think about workforce management, we define it as the art and science, and it really is both of those things. There's definitely a science to it or a math to it of all the calculations, but very much um, an art to getting this in place. But what it's all about is getting the just right number of people in place at the right times, not too many, not too few. What happens, unfortunately, in many call centers is that um, we all have these peaks and valleys of calls, right? 
So you may have a mid-morning peak and then it drops off middle of the day and you've got another peak in the afternoon. And what happens is sometimes we have sometimes we have the right number. We may have too many people when our call volume drops off and then we've got too few people in that afternoon peak. And then we sort of look at it at the end of the day and that average and think, well, <clears throat> we sort of evened out for the day. But that's really not what workforce management is about. We really want to get that just right number really every single period of the day. And we want to get that just right number to do two things. We want to maximize service. We want to provide as good a service as we can to our callers, minimize delays. And we also have to do that with an eye to what we're spending. So we also want to look at doing all this so that we maximize our personnel resources and minimize cost. So that's what workforce management's all about. And you know what? It's, it's difficult to do. Um, there are some real challenges in, in getting this right. So on the next slide, um, we're looking at what makes this so difficult. Well, <clears throat> several things here. <coughs> Excuse me. And the first one is basically the kind of work that we have. Unlike other work, call center work is really out of our control. Um, it's unpredictable. It's random. And I'm going to explain what that means in just a second. We also have an invisible queue situation to deal with, which makes it even more important that we manage those delay times and our caller expectations. And then we have a service expectation from our customers these days that needs to be closely managed. So let's take a quick look at, first of all, what makes workforce management so difficult in the first place. So in the next slide, you see that one of the, the unique characteristics about call center staffing is the way the work arrives to us, and it arrives randomly. It's out of our control. Callers out there pick up the phone and dial whenever they decide to pick up the phone and dial. We really have not much control over that. The work is predictable to some degree. And you see a, a statement there that says predictable but unpredictable. What do I mean by that? Well, it is predictable. You do have some patterns out there. You probably know that you're going to get more calls on Monday than the other days of the week. And you probably know what your busiest hour of the day today is going to be. But frankly, within any given hour, between um, 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning, you may have a pretty good idea about how many calls, but what you really have no control over is how those calls arrive between 10 and 11 in the morning. And what we mean by that is what you have is random compared to sequential kind of work, and that's really what drives the difference in call center staffing. So the next slide we're going to take a look at that and why it's why it's so different and what the staffing implications of that are. So let's say we have two different groups of people. One's working down in the mail room processing paperwork and you've got another group sitting in your call center. So if down in the mail room in a, the last hour of the day today you have 400 pieces of mail to process and each one takes three minutes to handle that's 1,200 minutes of work to do. <clears throat> if we divide that by 60, that's 20 hours of work. So for that situation, if we want to get all wrapped up that last hour of the day, we've got 20 hours of work to do. How many people would we need in place to do that down in the mailroom? Pretty easy answer. We need 20 people, right? And we have a one-to-one -one ratio of the people needed compared to the work to do. And that's because we have a sequential kind of work, one task right behind the other one. But now we come down the hall to our incoming call center, <clears throat> and maybe we're getting 400 calls to handle. They each take three minutes. So we've got the same 1,200 minutes or 20 hours of work to do, but how many people would we need in our call center to do that same amount of work? And the answer is <laughs> more than 20. We can't really do it very well with 20 people. And the reason for that is at any given point in the day, we really have no control over what's coming in the door. So if we're looking at the last hour of the day from 4 to 5 o'clock, then at 4.05, we may be getting exactly 20 calls in, and life is good. All 20 people are busy on a call. But then at 10 minutes after 4, there may only be 12 calls arriving. So 12 people are busy on a call, 
but eight people are just sitting there idle, not doing anything. It's not because they're lazy or shiftless or not working hard. There's just no work presenting itself, so they're naturally idle at that point in the hour. And then maybe at 4.30, there's 25 calls, so all 20 people are busy, and there's five calls waiting in queue. But the point of this is that there's an ebb and flow of calls throughout the hour, meaning that there will necessarily be periods of idle time. And therefore, we can't assume that a person can handle one full hour's worth of work during that hour that they're sitting there with the headset on ready to go. There will be some idle time. So we can't use the one-to-one -one ratio. We will always have to have more staff hours in place than the actual hours of work to do. So that's one of the difficulties of call center staffing. Um, the next one comes from basically the queue situation that's out there. So if we look at what kind of queues are going on, think about the last place that maybe you waited um, in queue someplace. Maybe it's at the bank, although most people don't wait in line in banks anymore. We do it all online, I guess. Um, but you know, think about going to the um, airport for a flight or your favorite store. You know, over here in the U.S., we use Walmart as an example where everybody goes to shop. Not as, uh, not as good an example for, uh, for my, my group this morning, I guess. But someplace you're waiting in line. And when you go and you, let's, let's say that you're, um, you're at a store, you're checking out at the end, you're buying your groceries, and you're looking at the queue in front of you, you have information in front of you to, number one, perhaps pick the queue you want to get in. Um, you see how many people are in front of you. You have some information about how long it's probably going to take. And you can see yourself moving along in the queue. So while you may be upset at first, thinking, oh, there's two people in front of me, this is going to take forever, as you move along in the queue, your frustration level actually goes down. And finally, we're happier as we're served at the end. Compare that to a contact center queue where you get the message of, all agents are busy, please hold for the first available representative. And so you may be thinking, okay, my call is important to them, they're going to get to me right away, you know, you're feeling pretty good about it, but then the call is not going anywhere. It's sitting in queue, you're listening to music for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a few minutes now, and you're less and less happy as a result. So as you go along, your frustration level is actually going up. And that's because we have no information in most cases. We don't know where we are. Are we next? How, many, uh, how much longer? There's no information to tell us where we are and when we're going to be served. So frustration levels go up to the point at which we may make it all the way out to the end, and that caller is very frustrated by the time they get to us. So we either have an upset caller or we have someone that has decided not even to wait with us, and they've abandoned the call. So one of the difficulties about call center staffing is figuring out what that tolerance level is for those delays and making sure that we staff so that we're getting to them before that level of frustration really um, hits home. So we want to staff based upon service expectations. So if we look at the next slide, we're staffing um, primarily most call centers. We're staffing in order to meet customer service demands, delay numbers. But there's two other groups of people that we're staffing to, to keep happy as well. So we always want to think about that. And I want you to, to really leave this seminar with this concept in mind that any time you're thinking about a staffing decision of any kind, you're, you're looking at the implications of three different stakeholder groups. You're looking at certainly customers and we want to do that so that those frustration levels are kept as low as possible. But you're also staffing to keep your frontline staff, your agents happy. We want to staff so that they're getting a, um, a doable workload and not too busy but not too idle either. And then the other group of people you need to keep happy, especially if you want to get a paycheck every day is we want to keep senior management happy. So we're looking there at staffing to the point where we're minimizing cost. And that's really what workforce management is about, is it's staffing for all three of those levels and keeping all three of those groups happy. So we're going to be addressing all three of those as we look at some staffing scenarios. 
So let's take a look now at the next slide. What if we get it wrong? What if we have too many or too few people in place? Uh, for many of you, you don't have to worry too much about overstaffing. You almost never have too many staff, but there may be periods of the day where the call volume is dropped and there's actually more people in place than you need. So the implications of that, number one, will be needless cost for an unnecessary people we don't need in place. And that can be very expensive, that cost of idle time. And we have a lower productivity, a lower occupancy level. So that's not good. On the other side of that, we have not enough people in place and very important implications here, poor service to customers, our first stakeholder group, overworked staff, our second stakeholder group, and higher costs uh, perhaps for the delay time and just delivering the service, as well as potentially lost revenue. So let's take a closer look at some real numbers now. And the implications of, of getting this wrong. Anytime we look at a staffing decision, we always want to look at what is the impact of just one person. And there's so many reasons uh, for, for everyone in the call center to understand this. It's such an important concept, this power of one. When we talk about the power of one, we're actually talking about two different things. One is helping your frontline staff understand the power of one as it relates to the important role that they play in customer service and customer interactions. So there's nobody more important, there's no one that has more chance for interaction and building customer relationships than those frontline people on the phones. So they need to understand the very important role they play in being the voice of the company to your callers and likewise being the voice of those callers back into your company. So that's one very important side of the power of one. It's just the customer service implications. But there's another side to the power of one, which is the operational impact of just one person. So here's the way we look at it. We look at what impact one person has on service to callers, occupancy for the other staff, and bottom line cost. So let's take a look at some numbers, and um, it, these numbers, I think, illustrate that concept best. So this is an example where we have 26 hours of work to do. Our earlier example, we had 20 um, hours in the mailroom. We bumped that up just a little bit here. So 26 hours of work to do. We said earlier that, okay, that means that we have to have more than 26 staff. Well, how many more? Well, how many more depends upon the level of service or the delay that we want to provide. So many contact centers today use um, ASA or average speed of answer as that service goal definition, uh, but the majority around the world use service level. So in this example, we are looking to the point where we're meeting a 70% in 30 second speed of answer goal. So that occurs here with 29 staff. You see that we would need 29 staff in place in order to deliver either an under 30 second ASA, average speed of answer, or better than a 70% service level. So there's our number. But then let's look up and down on the table. Let's look at the implications of the power of one. We might a move just one step in either direction and look what happens. First, if we add staff, we go from a 28 second delay on average. We add a person, that improves to 16 seconds. So we've made a 12 second improvement there. If we add one more person, we improve once again. We go from 16 seconds to 9 seconds. Well, we didn't make a 12 second improvement this time. We only made a 7 second improvement. And you know what, if we add one more person, we're probably going to get about a 4 second improvement. So do you see the pattern that's happening here? Every time we add another person, we get an improvement in service, but we get less and less and less of it each time. So one of the rules of call center staffing is that there's a law of diminishing returns here. 
We get an improvement, but less and less so each time. But now look at the other direction. When we remove a person, we take just one person away and we go from 29 staff to 28. There's a difference of 27 seconds. We go from a 28 second delay on average to 55 seconds. And if we remove just one more person, it's not a 27 second jump this time. No, it's a huge jump in service this time. So it's almost tripling. So as we are removing staff, service worsens each time, but it's really important for everyone to understand that it worsens exponentially. And where it really gets us in trouble is where the number of staff is getting closer and closer and closer to your actual hours of workload to do. So that's where that really jumping off point is. As we go from um, 28 staff to 27, we're getting very, very, very near to the 26 hours of workload to do. And that's where we're really in staffing uh, trouble. Now, so with these numbers, this may be clear to the workforce team that, okay, we need to really try and get that 29 people in place. But what is the implication if we're just a few off? We've looked at the service implication. I'm going to show you the other two in just a minute. But I think one of the keys here is helping your staff understand that this is a dilemma. Because do you have people sometimes in your call center say, well, I need to come in late on Thursday morning. And you say, well, that's really a problem with, you know, it's going to be a problem with service that morning. And they're looking at you thinking, I'm one out of, you know, 25 people, 30 people. What difference could it possibly make? You hardly even notice as you look out over the call center that someone's missing, right? So I think one thing we need to do is we need to help them understand the power of one and the impact that's going to have. So what you see here is the impact that it has on the customer and speed of answer. But we also want to look at and communicate the impact that it has on our other groups as well. So as we look at the next slide, what we're also seeing here, and what we, we also want to um, demonstrate to our staff, is sort of how it affects them personally and how it affects the people around them. So this is an important number, I think, from an operational perspective as well as something that your staff can really understand. And that's the measure of staff occupancy. Basically, it's how busy they are. So it's the percent of time that an agent is actually involved in call handling during the hour that they're, they're logged in, ready to go, headset on, they're ready to take calls. How busy are they while they're out there ready to go? We want them busy. We are, after all, paying them to do this work. However, we don't want them so busy that it's just call after call after call after call with no sort of breather in between. So we measure how busy they are by this number called staff occupancy or agent occupancy. It's a simple measure of just workload hours divided by staff hours. So the, the first poll is, do you measure agent occupancy? Share the results up on the, uh, up on the screen. That's the first poll. So 66% say yes, 27% no, and 7% don't know. Is that in line with your um, your results? You tend to uh, tend to get penny. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, majority of call centers measure it. It's not always where they want it to be, <laughs> but the, they certainly have it as one of their KPIs, their key performance indicators. So here's another poll, and that is for those of you that are measuring it, you should be able to answer this. During your busy hour today, what do you expect your occupancy to be? And I, I, I know we're going to get some different numbers here before I even see the results because we had different sizes of call centers participating. So the small call centers, by virtue of the smaller sizes, the, the, the work basically is more random as, as a result. And therefore, <coughs> it will always be lower in a smaller call center that's, that's staffing for the same level of service as a larger one. And then, of course, some of these numbers are going to be based on, you know, how, how good are your staffing levers and your schedules. So uh, I generally expect these numbers to be all over the place, and indeed they are. So we see the poll results under 70%, 13% uh, of our, our um, 
audience here, and I would suspect that most of the people that were in that range were some of our smaller call centers that were under 50 seats or certainly under 100. Uh, we have our biggest number here in the 81 to 90 percent, and that's actually where, kind of where you want to be. So that's, that's good news, I think. Um, we want people busy, um, but not too busy. So what is too busy? Well, you know, when it starts to get in the over 90 percent, and certainly in the over 95 percent, it's that call after call after call, which is you know troublesome for our, our staffing purposes. And I think what we see there is when it does creep over and, and up into those high occupancy numbers, you have a situation where people aren't getting a break between the calls, so they're going to give themselves a break. So they're either going to talk longer to a nice friendly person on the phone, not to have to take the next call, or most likely go into after call work and stay there longer than needed, take an unscheduled break, uh, just place an outbound call and listen to dial tone for a while, you know, whatever it takes to get a break. So you really don't want those occupancy numbers to go too high and that's one of the other implications of the power of one. So let's go back to our slides now. And what we've done in this chart is we've added an occupancy uh, column here so with our ideal staffing level there with 29 people, we were at 90% occupancy, which is kind of as, it's about as high as you want to go, but everybody's very utilized, so that, that's a pretty good number. But if we take just one person away, one person's missing, then that number goes up to 93%. And that doesn't look like that, it's that big a jump, right? Just 3%, uh, probably not, not even going to feel that. Well, what you want to do is you want to think about occupancy is not how busy you are, but what, what happened to their idle time. So with 29 people in place, everybody had 10% kind of time off within the hour. But when we take even one person out, that 10% has gone to now only 7%. And if two people out of this group are missing, we're only going to have 4% idle time. It's cut in half with two people missing out of 29 people. Again, we're talking about less than 10% of the staff, but just two people kind of not being where they're supposed to be, everybody in the group, their idle time is cut more than, more than in half. So we really want to watch our staffing and watch people being in place, not just from a customer point of view, but what it's doing to the other staff around them too. And then there's one more impact. So if we go to the next slide, there's one more thing to look at, and that is what it's doing to bottom line cost. So in this example, these were the actual number of calls and available staff and the actual delays that were um, being delivered as a result of this. There can be a big impact on cost. So depending upon if you are uh, footing the phone bill, so if you have a, a toll-free or free phone service so that your call center is paying the phone bill for these calls to come in, then all the time that they're out there waiting, those long delays are not bad just from a customer perspective, but your phone bill's going up too. So what you see in this chart is basically the extra time spent in the queue based upon these various staffing levels, what that equates to in terms of minutes, and then what we did was basically look at about a five cents per minute fully loaded telephone rate, um, actually price that out. So that the extra phone cost between 29 and 28 staff, um, a pretty big difference there, the additional phone cost. And this is not at the end of the month on the phone bill. This is for that one hour period. So you're basically getting an extra 20 pounds worth of phone cost um, for that hour if it's 29 versus 28 staff. So the impact on the bottom line can be substantial as well. So. Um, to sort of wrap up this power of one talk here, three impacts, and we always want to consider what happens to our three stakeholder groups um, on the next slide. We always want to look at what is the impact on customers with service, what's the impact on staff with our occupancy, and then we also want to measure what's happening to our bottom line in terms of cost. So there's two things we need to have in place to make this happen. One is doing all the right things, getting the right schedules so that our staffing numbers are indeed right, but then 
convincing our staff that this is an important thing too. And, and part of it is that they just sometimes don't understand, oh, really? It makes that much difference if I'm in my seat or not? Um, so we have a poll here. Do you think your staff understand this power of one concept? Very important that we do some education here. And, and there's several ways to do the education. I'm just going to keep talking while you're voting here. Um, several ways to do this education. One is to show them some charts and graphs and tables, just like you've seen. And some people will, will get it. Um, and they'll understand what you mean by that. But we also see call centers and the workforce team in some call centers doing many different kinds of activities to demonstrate and communicate this power of one concept. Um, we, the, the most common one is the tennis ball toss. So you get a couple of um, cans of tennis balls. And in a team meeting, you have people come up and you know six people have a tennis ball. And they pair up and toss a, a ball back and forth with their partner. And the balls stay in the air. Those represent calls being handled. But then you remove a person. And as long as somebody steps in to take their spot, the balls keep getting tossed and calls keep getting handled. And then you remove a person and you don't replace them. So now a person's left to juggle two balls by themselves or four pe or three people are, are juggling four balls. Anyway, some balls drop on the ground. It's more stressful for the people left behind. That's one way to, to sort of demonstrate. Another um, very easy thing to do is just have everybody standing around with, their, with a cup of water. And everybody's cup is filled to 90%. And someone leaves. Well, as long as there's a person coming with an empty cup to take that workload, then um, it's fine. But then you have someone leave, and they have to distribute the water in their cup amongst all the other ones. And at some point, somebody's cup is overflowing. And so someone's getting wet, and that's funny. And that's, that's an example that they'll remember. So as you're doing Power of One training and education, um, it's really important that they understand First of all, the impact they make, the power of one in the customer interaction. And I think that's probably the most important power of one uh, concept to get across. But also the power of one operationally. So what, helping them understand what impact they have on delays, on the occupancy of one another, and bottom line cost. So in our poll here, uh, we're about half and half, I guess, with uh, uh, almost half saying, no, they don't get it. So hopefully you have some ideas for how to share that information with them. And um, only, sadly, only 3% of our group here is saying that they all get it. Well, it's really important that this is a concept that, that everybody understands, every single person in the call center understands. Um, very, very important that we communicate that um, and that that's a concept that is um, universally understood. So that's one ingredient in the power of one is that communications and education. Um, the other part is just getting um, the right number of people in place in the first place. And that's all about workforce management. So we need to have a process in place where we are looking at our past data to predict the future. So gathering historical information, using that to forecast how many calls and workload we're going to have tomorrow, next week, next month, determining the right number of resources in place, creating schedules that really match up workforce to workload, and tracking how well we're doing each day. Which brings us to uh, the steps, and there are certainly tools to help in this process and getting to that just right number. So um, I'm going to turn this over now to Chris to take you through what some of the key ingredients are uh, with, in resources to make sure that this Power of One number is, is in place. Very good. Thanks very much, Penny. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Deely from uh, Envision Software. Uh, actually, Envision and the Goal Center School are, in fact, sister companies. So you won't be surprised if uh, I tell you that uh, we like to think we've got a good understanding at Envision of the, the importance of the power of one, and also that we've got uh, a tool, a workforce management tool, which supports a lot of the power of one and, and other important um, concepts in the field of workforce management. So the slide I've got here is saying what you'll be looking for in a workforce management tool, workforce management solution that manages the power of one. I'm going to highlight just three of those. You know, we haven't got a lot of time today, but just to give you some food for thought. The first one is 
looking for the importance of looking for a tool that's flexible in the staffing calculations that are used. Now, Penny touched upon the difference between uh, planning for the front office, uh, inbound calls, and, and talked about the relationship between uh, volume, staffing, service level, and so on. But there's a different approach required for the back office, as, as Penny highlighted. So what you should really be looking for, I think, is a tool whereby you can choose the most appropriate method to your business drivers. Uh, we, what we've been talking about so far today has mainly been based upon the uh, Erlang uh, formula, which a lot of you, I think, will be familiar with. But there are many other ways of calculating staffing properly. And you need to pick one that properly matches your operation, whether that's front office, back office, whether it's an abandoning contact like a call or a chat, or non-abandoning like correspondence or email. Next thing uh, I think is important to look for is uh, Penny's mentioned you know, the, the old concept that no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. And that's why it's important that we have timely warnings of entering a situation of under and overstaffing. So we, we need to have you know, good reporting, real-time reporting, and schedule management, which is updated in real time. So here's a, a, a picture of uh, quite an important part of our product, a so-called online cockpit, which is a real-time graphical reporting tool. And really what it's about is, is presenting you with a completely up-to-date dashboard. So as soon as data is received from the ACD or CTI, it's updated instantly on your screen. So here we can see, for example, that volume on this particular day is looking much higher than the forecast. So we can expect to be running into some of those um, unfortunate outcomes which Penny was mentioning earlier. This is the schedule management screen uh, in the Envision product called the Shift Center. I haven't got time to go into it in a great deal of detail, but there are two important panels. At the top, we have uh, the, the shifts, uh, indicating the, the, uh, the, the schedules that have been assigned to the uh, agents. And in the bottom, we have uh, the statistics window, or so-called heat map. It's called the heat map because the colors indicate whether you're understaffed, overstaffed, or, or staffed, or just about right. Now, let's say that the call volume has gone up. Uh, it's more than we expected. Then there will be an instant impact on the heat map. This could also be true, be, be true if we have uh, agents calling in sick. So I'm, I marked there two agents calling in sick. And we instantly see the impact in the statistics window. So we can see even one or two staff have made a big difference to that heat map. We've gone from a situation of having you know, good service level and good occupancy. And we're now looking uh, rather busier, particularly for those service calls. Third thing to highlight is obviously when things do go wrong and we're out by one person or, or, or two people, uh, it's really helpful to have power tools to help react on the day on an informed basis. So a, a tool that can suggest solutions like providing a stand-in agent to replace that one who is now unavailable, or a tool that can optimize the brakes automatically to even out uh, the, the coverage and the utilization. Uh, optimizing jobs if you've got multiple uh, queues that you could serve. And of course, what you really want is any changes you make manually to try and correct the situation will be checked in real time to make sure you're not breaking any rules like the working time directive. So here's one example. Uh, let's say that uh, we have an agent who's called in sick. We're down one person compared to where we need to be. Quickly tell me who could stand in at short notice. Now, that's one of the features uh, in, in our product, which is very helpful to keep us at the perfect staffing, even in the light of, of problems that occur on the day. Can't resist uh, the opportunity to say a little bit more about uh, InVision and, and our product. What else is different about us compared to some of the other products you may have seen out there? We're very proud of our uh, schedule optimization capability. Uh, it's, as Penny said, the workforce management is about getting the right number of people with the right skills in place at the right time. Easy to say, sometimes not easy to do. And we pride ourselves on the quality of that optimization and also the fact that our algorithms respect all the necessary uh, rules and constraints like the working time directive or family friendly legislation. Second thing uh, to, to mention is the skills based scheduling. It's not something we've touched upon today. Uh, it's a big subject in its own right and it offers a great deal of uh, efficiency potential by enabling the scheduling of, uh, of agents who've got more than one skill. So potentially you have uh, less downtime even during uh, quiet periods. The key thing about our approach to skills based scheduling is it's, it's about being very easy to use, not a lot of tedious setup, and it runs very quickly. So you, you get those optimized schedules in double quick time. 
couple of other final things to mention. Uh, today, it's been great to have uh, Penny on the call uh, with us. Uh, Penny and I are, are colleagues in the Envision Group, and we have consultants covering both our applications, uh, call center operations, which is uh, what the call center school is all about, and we have a strategic labor consulting uh, wing as well, which is looking at uh, re really a strategic view of moving to more efficient um, deployment of our staff. Final thing to mention is uh, Envision is a product that's uh, that gives you various routes to getting access to the software. There's the traditional approach of, pe uh, of buying a software license with a one-off lifetime fee, and you install uh, the software on a server in your premises. It's also possible to buy the software in the same way with a one-off fee, but we take care of the hosting, uh, the maintenance, the installation of updates, uh, and, and all that kind of thing, making your, your IT colleagues' lives a lot easier. And the third, and uh, we think most innovative approach, is we're offering the thing on a software as a service basis. There is nothing installed uh, on your premises, uh, and uh, it's, it, it's a true cloud multi-tenant solution. And there's no one-off fee. It's a pay-as-you-go model at nine pounds per agent per month. So we've had a lot, a lot of interest from this uh, since we launched it earlier this year, and uh, we like to think that we've got a, a route to suit each company and its and its business model to going with us. Which is, uh, do you believe your workforce management system uh, can help you manage the power of one? So just be interested there. 46% uh, of you believe your workforce management system can help you manage the, the power of one. 36% or 35% partially, 12% no, 8% don't know. Chris, does that sort of tie in line with the, your expectations? That's not, not, into, not, not at all unexpected. Uh, I, I'm guessing that among the, the audience today, uh, particularly among the larger centers, uh, a lot of the participants have got uh, a workforce management tool in place at the moment which would support um, many of these concepts. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's now at the uh, time of the uh, of the session where we can deal with uh, questions and answers for the uh, panels, uh, panel members. We've had a number of questions that have been uh, sent through. Um, we've had uh, quite a number of people um, have asked for the free uh, sessions to go along and see the uh, call centre uh, school in Stirling in Scotland and Huddersfield. Uh, so if anyone else is interested, you can put your details uh, in here, and uh, we'll make sure the first 10 people uh, get uh, get a ticket to that. Um, a number of people have asked, uh, who've come in a sort of bit late, uh, if it's possible to get a copy of the slides and a replay of the webinar. Uh, those will be available uh, later. Um, we've had a number of questions about uh, service level, um, which I think... Uh, We've uh, sort of um, uh, been a penny has been able to answer slightly on chat, but um, there was a, a sort of question there: What is the calculation for service uh, service level? And uh, Penny, I know that you've um, you've said that, that that could be covered in the white paper. Yes, we have um, several giveaways as part of the the class today, and one of those. These questions come up about all the calculations and, and limited time in this <laughs> webinar to cover them all. So. We do have a white paper called The Mathematics of Call Center Staffing, and it does explain um, starting from um, the ground up and how to do the calculations of workload and what the Erlang calculations are that point to what service levels will be and so on. So that, that white paper will be available. <clears throat> it's, we're getting it over to, uh, to Jaunty at Call Center Helpers so, uh, that can be distributed to everyone for download. So hopefully um, after the, the session today, that will be immediately available as well as copy of the slides. Um, I've been answering some of the questions just one-on-one -on -one that have come in um, related to, to some of the questions, but this may be a good time to just address some um, verbally um, that many of you may be thinking and, and asking. Um, one question is a good question. Is there a relationship between occupancy and AHT, average handle time? And the answer is, is yes. Um, there is a relationship in that occupancy is basically workload divided by staffing, and um, workload, um, half of that workload calculation is indeed um, average handle time. So workload is the number of calls, the call volume multiplied by handle time. So the higher the handle time, obviously, um, the more work there is to do and the higher the occupancy level. So yes, there is a relationship there. 
Um, there's also a causal relationship in that the higher the occupancy, the busier people are and the less idle time between calls, it will drive up the handle time. It will absolutely happen. It's just really um, interesting to look at and watch those numbers in a graph. So as you're, if you look at different times of day and plot a graph with um, occupancy at your busier times of day, watch handle time go up. Like I said, it, it will either be longer handle times of talk time or um, the after call work part. So there's a very important relationship between those two. That was a really good question. Okay, wonderful. We've got a couple of uh, questions for uh, Chris, uh, people looking for specific um, information. We've got one uh, gentleman who's looking to uh, purchase a workforce management tool uh, for about 400 uh, uh, people and they've looked at a number of uh, different products. Uh, I think the questions like that, we've also got a, uh, another gentleman who's asking for sort of product information sent through. Chris, presumably you can, you can follow up on these more specific uh, questions with people after the, uh, part, people after the event. Yes, yeah, certainly. I'll be, I'll be delighted to, John. In fact, my typing is not what it should be. I was just composing a reply to Hassan at the moment, and uh, I've not completed it, but we'll absolutely follow up with these queries. Okay, Chris. And uh, could you just uh, give everyone your email address, because I think uh, some people may want to contact you directly. Yes, of course. It's uh, chris.dealy. Uh, Dealy is spelled D for Delta, E-A-L-Y, at Envision WFM. That's all one word, Envision uh, Workforce Management, WFM.com. Okay, wonderful. We'll also add that onto the, uh, the page after the event as well. Um, Penny, we've got a question that's come in from Ryan saying, what's best practice, close your ears on this one, uh, Chris, uh, what is the best practice to man manage agent breaks without a workforce management solution? Well, um, <laughs> that's tough. It, life depends on size. Um, there are a couple of you know best practices there. Um, one, um, the easier things to do is um, basically have your I sort of say have your staff stagger into work. I don't mean putting a beer keg out in the parking lot or anything, but um, <laughs> having your, your start times um, staggered. So rather than having a group all start at eight, you have you know a group start at seven thirty, seven forty five, eight eight fifteen, and that will naturally stagger the breaks you know later on in the day. That's that's one technique. Whether you're using a workforce management solution or not, that can can help. Um, we've seen a variety of, of things. You know, sometimes, believe it or not, and it doesn't happen often, but we've actually seen these things sort of self-manage with little flag systems, and everybody's got, you know, there's a certain number of flags up, and is, if there's a flag, you can go up and take it and take a break and come back. So there's all kinds of manual approaches that are, are done out there in call centers. But to Certainly actually, one of the ones that I, I impressed me quite recently was uh, something called a lunch buddy. And uh, this isn't actually someone you go to lunch with. This is mm -hmm. effectively a, a bit like a, a relay system or a tag mm -hmm. system where, you know, for instance, I can't go to lunch. I've got to agree with, with Joe, for instance, um, you know, about lunch break. So I can't go to lunch until Joe comes back. So if Joe's a bit, you know, sort of delayed coming back from lunch, that impacts on when I go. So that's a sort of a way of between two people making sure that you've always got one person uh, one person covered, and I've seen that work quite nicely. Absolutely, that's that's a great. Um, and again, it's sort of a self-managed sort of uh, process, but it, it works. Now, as you get bigger and bigger, that becomes obviously more difficult to do. But as you get bigger and bigger, that's where typically you can justify uh, more tools to sort of help you plan and manage and track all this. Okay, wonderful. We've had a, a question that has uh, come in of saying, Penny, if anyone has any queries after reading your white paper, is it, is it possible to contact you? Yes, and my contact details um, are um, available or on the white paper, so if you do have questions after you read that, I'm always happy to, um, to take questions, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. I've got a question in from Karen saying, does uh, average handling time include wrap time? Um, and the answer is yes. Average handle time is talk time plus after call work or wrap time, whatever whatever you call it. Um, so yes, it is both pieces. Okay, wonderful. A um, question that's come in from Jason. What is the best way of measuring if your staff are pro productive during that occupancy state? 
I'm not sure if I fully fully get the, yeah, the question sure. now. I don't know if you. What's the best way of measuring if your staff are productive during the occupancy state? Well, um, occupancy again is basically <clears throat> somebody else had asked the question about productive time, uh, and we really want to separate the two. And this is all explained in that white paper. But um, there's shrinkage or unproductive time. So the breaks, meetings, lunches, just wandering around, we can't find them. All those things that take people away from being there in their seats ready to handle a call. We call that shrinkage, and we sort of take all that out first so that when we're talking about occupancy, it's just the productive time. It's just the, or, or available time. Um, different call centers use different um, terminology there. But again, accounting for breaks, lunches, meetings, all that set aside, it's the scheduled time and available time on the phones that they're logged in, ready to go. Occupancy is a measure of how busy are they during that period of time. So in terms of how you measure it, um, it's, it's simpler because it's logged into the ACD time, and then how busy are you as a result of that. So those statistics are, are pretty readily available just straight out of the ACD. Okay, wonderful. Uh, uh, Chris, we've got a couple of uh, questions for you on the, on the Envision pro, uh, pro, pro, um, product. The first one, or related to it, the first one from Pat, saying I run a contact center with 250 seats. How rare is it for a call center of this size not to have a workforce management system? And uh, how, how efficient would we be with that without it? This is absolutely spooky, John, because I was beast beefing up my uh, webinar skills by typing a reply to Pat as we were speaking. Ah, but okay. let me jump in and answer verbally. So, uh, Pat, I, 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 we certainly come across call centers of that sort of size who aren't using an integrated workforce management solution. But I would say more often than not, there is one in place already. Uh, to answer how much more efficient you could be or how efficient could uh, a CIC of that size be without workforce management, and the best way of answering that is to say that typically when we look at the improvement in efficiency, which is to say you know, handling um, more calls with fewer people or uh, however we want to measure uh, efficiency one way or the other, uh, we usually see a, at least a 10 to 20 percent improvement in efficiency by implementing a proper workforce management solution. So that's the potential I would suggest you could be looking at. Yeah, and we've got a question from, uh, I mean, certainly I think it's sort of driving a, a call center without workforce management system is a bit like trying to drive a car without a speedometer. You, you <laughs> don't quite exactly know what's happening. You, you kind of, you can use other thing, other ways like, you know, putting your hand out your window gives you an idea of how fast the air is moving past. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's really when you get to that size of contact center, I would, uh, I would recommend, uh, uh, you know, you should be having a workforce management uh, system. Uh, Rohit is uh, another thing to add on that. I mean, it, it, it size is one element certainly, but um, <clears throat> don't ignore the fact that some smaller centers actually have a more complex scheduling problem than than larger ones. You may have a, a 100 seat center that basically open from eight to five. It's not that difficult when people should come to work and go home, but you may have um, 40 seats and you're open 24 by 7, and you've got all kinds of unique scheduling rules and whatever, I mean, that's more of an application for really needing workforce management than a large one. So it's not just size. I mean, that's, that's a, the key factor, but also, you know, how complex is the scheduling problem? That's where workforce management can really um, pay for itself, are those, those kinds of dilemmas. And we're seeing more and more of that now, again, with smaller centers, and, you know, the one good um, news these days with some of these new cloud offerings and so on, the subscription-based services, is that workforce management that used to be only affordable by those very large call centers um, is now very much scalable down to the you know, 20, 30, 40 seat centers uh, that need those capabilities too.